All right, here we go in three, two, one. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Sports Medicine Broadcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Jackson. We are talking about building relationships relationships with local medical providers. Before we get started, I'm going to give a shout out to Dr. Mark Knobloch. I'm publishing his book. So very cool. Dr. Knobloch has been on here, but he's been uh, working hard on this book. And we're going to be talking about it actually during March as we're talking about uh, AT owned businesses and he's got kind of got a book publishing company. And so we're gonna be talking about that and his book and the process and how you might be able to do that too. But congratulations, Dr. Knobloch. So joining me again, my friend, Dr. Josh Yellen, <clears throat> we're, this is a really cool opportunity here because if anybody has been working their tail off to build a strategic, strategic partnerships it's Dr. Yellen. So since he got here in Houston, uh, he's just been, Anybody and everybody that's medical related, he's kind of met with them, talked with them, kind of assessed whether or not they're a good fit for his program and his students. And so looking at it from his situation and then also from my situation as a secondary school athletic trainer in the high school, kind of what I've done, where I can improve, what I've done well, uh, and then to see what we can do as athletic trainers to build those relationships and continue growing together uh, under like the medical model as a profession of athletic trainers. So Dr. Josh Yellen, welcome again. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a fun topic to talk about and it's something that I'm extremely passionate and interested in. Uh, and so let's start, right? Let's, let's uh, start with a little bit of a uh, business lesson and I'm going to throw this out there for all the athletic trainers and those that are listening. Um, uh, before I get into it, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Ricky Horn. Ricky uh, came home from the hospital. He's recovering from a pretty intensive uh, surgery that has to do with bladder cancer. So, uh, Ricky, if you're listening, uh, stay in the fight, brother. We're all we're all rooting for you. We all love you. Uh, and I actually, I think my my dad is listening, Doctor Yellen. Uh, Doctor Yellen first. Um, yeah, and he's uh, he's a uh, clinical and sports psychologist out in. Uh, Granada Hills, California. His office is in Northridge. He's got a really interesting background. He can tell you about um, all the crazy things I did as a kid. Uh, he wrote a book about it called The Art of Perfect Parenting and Other Absurd Ideas. No, really? Oh, yeah, seriously. And if you want to learn about all of the embarrassing things in my life, you, Jeremy Jackson, can go and get it and read it and make fun of me. All right, so let's start off with a little bit of a lesson. Okay, for all those that are listening. So in order for us to build partnerships, one, you have to remember that as athletic trainers, we are medical professionals and we still have some of the old guard that are having trouble wrapping their, their uh, minds around this. We still have some in, in certain settings that are having trouble wrapping their mind about it. And uh, what I'd like to do is pre present uh, my argument and my case, and it's based on facts. So. One is, let's look at the current definition of an athletic trainer uh, as defined by the Board of Certification for Athletic Training. Those that don't know the website, www.bocatc.org. Um, you can go and find the definition uh, of uh, the BOC certified athletic trainer. So athletic trainers, and, and this is what I want to do, okay? I, I want to be able to read the definition and I want you to tell me in there, where in there did you hear sports? Where in there did you hear athlete? Where in here, where in there did you hear athletic? With the exception of the definition. Okay. So athletic trainers or ATs are healthcare professionals who render service or treatment under the direction of or in collaboration with a physician in accordance with their education and training and the state statutes, rules and regulations. As a part of the healthcare team, services provided by ATs include injury and illness prevention, wellness promotion and education, emergent care, examination and clinical diagnosis. I emphasize diagnosis because there are still some people who I don't know if they're uneducated or ignorant will say that athletic trainers cannot diagnose, and that is not an accurate statement. Uh, therapeutic intervention and rehabilitation of injuries and medical conditions. Mr. Jackson, please, based on this definition, with the exception of athletic trainers, show me or tell me where you heard the word uh, athlete or sports. 
All right, so the only time I heard it again was when it was specifically referring to the title AT or athletic trainer. Correct. Now, this definition, is it recognized by like the AMA? Like, or is this yeah. just the recommended? No, no, no. By... A athletic training is recognized by the American Medical Association as a healthcare profession and has been since the 1990s. Here's another thing that people don't. Uh, this is a universal definition in athletic training. And uh, it goes down to um, the strategic alliance. And those that don't understand the, the AT strategic alliance, that is the NATA, which is your professional organization, the BOC, which is your regulatory organization, the CADI, which is your accrediting organization, and what we call the Research and Education Foundation, or as we know it in kind of the AT world, the foundation. So this is a universal definition. And there are a lot of athletic trainers that are out there practicing that, in my opinion, right, we're just talking about Josh Allen's opinion, don't understand the business of what we do as athletic trainers. And, and we have to understand the business. And I, I'm going to put it out there. A lot of people disagree with me. I said the same thing about education. This is a business, right? This is about how many patients in, how many patients out, how do we justify our value? A lot of people say athletic trainers can't bill. That's not accurate either. Athletic trainers can bill. And so if we look at why, why we're moving um to you know the uh professional master's degree there's a there's a few reasons why one of them has to do with business that cms what we look at as current insurance will not reimburse for baccalaureate level providers that's the reason why pt in the 90s went from a bpt to an mpt and the reason why pt is going to a dpt now is because they want to be able to take whomever off the street. They have, they have uh, an entry-level clinical doctorate that is synonymous with a chiropractor. It's synonymous with a dentist. It's synonymous with a podiatrist. It's synonymous with anybody that has met the requirements for a, um, an, uh, the entry point into uh, a professional program with a doctorate. But underneath the medical model, we look at physicians, MD and DO. A lot of people get DO and OD confused. DO is a doctor of osteopathic medicine. Uh, MD is a doctor of medicine. Um, osteo osteopathy or osteopathic medicine is one um, mode of practicing medicine. Another mode of practicing medicine is allopathic. So it goes back to understanding the definition of what these things are. So now, um, as we get into how does, now that we've established the definition, how does athletic training as we know it today and where it is today and where it's going, how does it fit into the medical model? I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. Uh, here's the definition of primary care medicine as defined by the American Academy of Family Physicians. So primary care medicine or primary care includes health promotion, disease prevention, health maintenance, counseling, patient education, diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic illnesses in a variety of healthcare settings. So let's point out real quick uh, some of the common terms that we already see between primary care medicine and athletic training. Health promotion, disease prevention, health maintenance, uh, education, diagnosis, treatment, acute, chronic illness. Uh, and as we know now, athletic training is, is um, expanding out of its original roots. And its original roots came from, if you look historically, came out of a, a hybrid between physical therapy and physical education. So primary care is performed and managed by a personal physician, often collaborating with other health professionals and utilizing consultation or referral as appropriate. Primary care provides patient advocacy and healthcare system to accomplish cost-effective care by coordination of healthcare services. Primary care promotes effective communication with patients, meaning that it's patient-centered, and encourages the role of the patient as a partner in health. So when we look at building partnerships in medicine, the first partner is with the patient. That's your first partner because it's all about them. It's, it's patient-centered and whatever you think is going to be best. Now, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Explain to me how the HIVAMAT works. The HIVAMAT? Yeah. 
it's a know. it's a therapeutic modality right I know nobody is. nobody can really explain this right there has been one or two articles presented and they happen to be written in german and so when there's translation okay fine we we lose you know it's lost in translation a little bit but there are all these different theories as to how and why Hivamat works and how it how it gained popularity. Um, I have my own opinions, and uh, you know I'm I'm going to express this, saying I think Hivamat is beneficial if the patient thinks it's beneficial. As we look at its uh, efficacy clinically, we can't really um, define how the Hivamat is working because we just don't have enough evidence on its clinical efficacy. There are some that are experimenting with it and are coming out. So my point in bringing this up is that if the patient thinks it's working, then it's working. And this is a, this is a, um, a thought process that has developed in me over time. There was a time when I was out practicing and I, I you know, if, if it didn't have any clinical relevance, I wasn't going to use it because I thought it was a waste of time. Uh, but if the patient thinks it's working, then it's working. This is synonymous with um, how many of your athletes have you know some knee pain and they come to you and they say hey can you put some pre-wrap on my knee because i've got patellar tendonitis right so when when i was at spats dr mark merrick was talking about evps and oh, so yeah. he said evidence-based practice but there's also practice-based evidence and mm -hmm. so again it's it's important as athletic trainers for us to remember that just what you're saying right if the patient believes it and feels it, it's working right. then it's doing it's having a positive effect so what you're what you're describing something called, called anecdotal evidence that um, we just don't have enough research to explain why it's happening, but we know, we know that it is happening, right? We just, it's a phenomenon that is happening and I'm, you know, we're, we just can't explain it through the scientific process. It doesn't mean it's any more or less valuable. It just means that it's happening. All right. So remember the definition of primary care. Now, uh, let's reread the definition of athletic training again. So remember the definition of, of uh, primary care? We talked about health promotion, disease prevention, health maintenance, diagnosis, treatment, referral out to other people, patient-centered medicine, right? All that other stuff. Let's reread athletic trainers. Healthcare professionals who render service or treatment under the direction of or in collaboration with a physician. Okay, sounds pretty, right off the bat, we've got some synonymous terms. In accordance with their education training, all right, uh, we already talked about regulation. As part of the healthcare team, services provided by ATs include injury and illness prevention. We just talked about that, right? It's, it's in the first uh, sentence of primary care. Wellness promotion and education, right in there with primary care. Emergent care, which means acute. Uh, emergent care is emergency medicine. So those are all acute conditions. Uh, examination and clinical diagnosis. There's that word again, diagnosis, and I don't know why we still have athletic trainers that are saying athletic trainers can't diagnose. That's not true. You know why? Because we for a long time it wasn't in there, well, or, or it was told to us that we don't diagnose. We we uh, evaluate, evaluate, and we, we come send up with the doctor right. for diagnosis. Right, but it's right there. It's, and so it's, it's just an old school way of thinking and yeah, bingo, and not old being school. up to date. Yeah. Could you imagine? I mean, and I'm going to speak to. Um, my own experience. Could you imagine um, when I was being operated on for brain cancer? And, you know, it was an old, you know, the, a neurosurgeon just decided to go old school. To remove the whole top of the head or what? Yeah. I mean, I would have had an entire frontal lobotomy. That would have been it. But no, there's been some advancements. And uh, the advancement, thank God for me, was about... Um, something called an interoperative MRI, IMRI. So they went in, um, you know, they cracked me open like an egg and they scooped it out and they got uh, about 80% of it. And then I went through the IMRI and they realized there's about 20% more. So they went back and thank God for that IMRI. And UTMB was one of, I think, two at the time hospitals that had the IMRI. That's advancement. They had enough clinical success to say, yes, this produces better outcomes. And there's that word again, outcomes. What are outcomes? So here's the other thing that I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, that frustrates me. When I talk to practicing athletic trainers and I ask, 
Tell me about your outcomes. What are outcomes? In business, we call it analytics. In sports, we call it stats. Yeah, stats, analytics. Uh, show me the outcomes. It, you know, in business, we're going to use things like PL. You know what a PL is? Profit, profit and loss. Yeah, profit and loss statement. Uh, we're going to look at, you know, if I'm if I'm a distributor in business and let's say I make shoes, um, you know, I'm tracking how well did this shoe perform as compared to uh, the other shoes that I put on the market. It's all about outcome, you know, tracking this. And so this is another thing that athletic trainers just, some are really great at it and some are not. So how do you know how many people you're seeing? How many, how do you know what modalities are being used mo most often? How do you know what modalities or what interventions you're providing are most effective? Unless you're tracking it, that's business. And I love watching shows on CNBC. I love watching shows on, uh, you know, there's a great show called The Profit, right? Watch The Profit. Watch shows like The Shark Tank. Listen to how they're coming up with valuations because, you know, it's different than an evaluation. You know what a valuation is? A valuation is essentially how well, you know, what is your value? And you got to remember, your value is not a product. Your value is... Whom? You. you. You're it. You're the value. So something that I learned early on in my career, and it was uh, by a guy by the name of Jimmy Luker. And uh, Jimmy was uh, at the time the president of a major um, uh, uh, development company, real estate development, Ir the Irvine company. And so he taught me a great lesson. And what he taught me is, is that, you know what? They're not buying your product. They're buying you. They're not investing in your product. They're investing in you. So you better have the confidence and the ability to, um, you know, run with the big dogs. So back to the definition, right? Uh, part of the healthcare team, services provided by ATs include injury and illness prevention, wellness promotion, education, emergent care, examination, clinical diagnosis, therapeutic intervention, and rehabilitation of injuries and medical conditions. Show me in there where it said athlete, sports. It doesn't. And so this is one of the reasons why um, athletic trainers now are being used in every branch of the military. Um, they're being used in, uh, you know, settings, sports settings, right? So we still see athletic trainers in, in um, sports settings, professional collegiate, high school, so, or secondary, you know, uh, um, intermediate and secondary schools. Yeah, performing arts, DME. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Now, what people don't realize is this. Statistically speaking, there are more athletic trainers that are not in a sports setting than there are uh, in a sports setting, meaning this. More athletic trainers are leaving sports settings, and they're going into some of these emerging settings. Okay, uh, so before we go forward, again, let's let's lay down the groundwork here. What are my practice domains in athletic trainer? Domain one, injury and illness prevention and wellness promotion. It used to be a wellness prevention, but now it's wellness promotion. Why? Because we're right in line with primary care. We want to be able to promote medicine or promote health. And that's where the current healthcare model is going. It's all about disease uh, prevention and wellness promotion. If we can cut down on the costs of treating the disease and we can promote health, we've saved a lot of money. Athletic tra this is domain one. Those are athletic trainers' bread and butter, right? So that, that's a big thing that we should be promoting. Uh, two is examination, assessment, and diagnosis. There's that word again. Uh, domain three, immediate emergency care. Domain four, therapeutic intervention. A lot of people forget Therapeutic intervention is a combination of therapeutic modalities, rehabilitation techniques, and pharmacology. A lot of athletic trainers say, well, we're not physicians. Why do we need to know about pharmacology? Because a lot of times it's the athletic trainer that is leading the physician, right? So let's say you're an athletic trainer with the Olympics. And uh, one of the Olympic athletes goes to see a physician that is not within the network. And the physician prescribes, and this happened to us. Uh, when I was with the Olympic trials in 2004, uh, right? So physician prescribes this medicine. 
doesn't understand the NCAA and IOC regulations. You know, these medicines are banned. These are not, right? Olympic athlete comes back and says, I, I went to go see the doc, and this is what, you know, they prescribed. And we look at it and we go, sorry, you can't use this. Why not? They prescribed it. It's banned. It's a banned substance. Right? So now there's a bunch of justifications that are in place now where you can use them. So the athletic trainer has to know about the medicines. Now, they may not need to know all the pharmacokinetics that go into how the medicine is working. We're not pharmacists. We're not physicians. But we still need to understand how it's working because we need to be able to provide and, and direct the physician and the pharmacist. Uh, and then domain five is, is uh, healthcare administration and professional responsibility. And so if you look at it, right, that's the one that we're really talking about right now, healthcare administration, professional responsibility. How do we get out and start talking to um, all the other healthcare providers in a language that they understand? Because medicine is its own language. We use medical terms. We speak the business of language. There's uh, some great research that are coming out right now that some of those valuable physicians are the ones that are coming out with their medical degrees. And it's a combined uh, medical degree with an MBA or combined medical degree with a, a Juris Doctorate, right? MD, MBA, MD, uh, MPH, Masters in Public Health. MD, uh, JD, that's somebody that understands, you know, the legal aspects of uh, medicine. And so these are all things that we need to know about. Um, I've always said the athletic trainer that understands billing, and uh, you're very, very valuable. The athletic trainer that understands uh, evidence-based practice and how the business works is going to be the most valuable person in the world and, and it, or in, the, in that room. Um, there's somebody that's really putting out a lot of great evidence a lot of great um, research, the athletic trainer in the physician setting, and that's Forrest Pekka. And he's out there, man, he is a trailblazer. And so here's another thing that people don't understand. Remember athletic trainers were really promoting physician extenders? Guess what? In medicine, we're all physician extenders. We're all the extension of the physician. A lot of other professions don't like to use that word. But What's really unique about it is that athletic training made a decision to say, if we take, if we say we're a physician extender, we're really taking the word athletic trainer out of it. So now it's the athletic trainer in the secondary school setting, the athletic trainer in the collegiate setting, the athletic trainer in the professional sports setting, the athletic trainer in the physician setting, the athletic trainer in the occupational medicine setting, the athletic trainer in whatever, you know, the emergency care setting, the mass casualty setting. There's some real, there's some really great articles um in the nata news about the athletic trainers and all of these settings and all of the opportunities they're having so let's go back and and you know those that are listening and well, well i don't necessarily agree with yelling that's okay let's go to um let's go to the boston marathon who are the first responders at the boston marathon well you think you said that last week the athletic yeah, trainers it's the athletic trainers they're at the finish line they were right there so, um, you know, we always talk about athletic training ingenuity. They had to improvise. We're awesome at that, right? Uh, I remember being out in the field, and if there was a fracture, I, there were times that I was in a very low socio socioeconomic area uh, in the middle of Los Angeles. I didn't have the supplies. I had to use my brain, go and figure it out. Um, another thing that athletic trainers need to get up on is continuous quality improvement, CQI. Go and do some research about CQI. Go and look at some just business terms. Okay. Go and look at uh, Yale's six step process of problem solving. Every Ivy League school, every military academy, every liberal arts teaches that. They may not know it as the Yale six, pro six step process of problem solving. In business, uh, everybody's talking about what's called the uh, Lean Six Sigma. So if you're in business, a lot of people know about Six Sigma, especially those athletic trainers who are listening, like Jace Duke that's got his MBA. Uh, he learned about Little probably. Jared Parks is, yeah. Yeah, owns a personal training business. Yeah. Listening is he, live. So. Is he, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's watching live. Is he, uh, any time in, he goes, oh, I love Six Sigma. You should. Well, uh, maybe. It'd be a little bit, it's a little bit behind, so it may take oh, a second. All right. Um, 
So, right now that we've established the framework, okay, and everything, right? This is awesome. Uh, I'm going to call out a few people here. I'm going to call out. Um, I'm going to call out those athletic trainers that are not willing to evolve. I'm going to call out the athletic trainers that are in um, a position like mine. If you're a program director of an accredited athletic training program and you don't understand the business of what we're doing, shame on you. And here's the reason why. Right now, there are 360 some odd plus accredited athletic training programs. In 2022, when it officially converts over to a master's degree, we're not quite sure where it's going to go. We don't know if it's going to go up. We don't know if it's going to go down. What we're seeing is that a lot of universities that were already not in the marketplace for accredited athletic trainers are popping up. We're also going to see some universities that are going to say, we can't support uh, you know, a master's degree, so we're just going to back out. A, a great example, excuse me, a great example is the state of Louisiana. Um, when I was in Louisiana, shout South out to Scott Arsenault listening. Here. Hey, I know Scotty. Uh, when I was in the state of Louisiana, there were six accredited athletic training programs. They were LSU, ULL, uh, Southeastern Louisiana University, Louisiana College, McNeese State. Um, there was a uh, Nickel State. Is that one, two, three, four, five? Yep. Uh, so LSU is still in it. Uh, LSU or ULL is, uh, in the process of petitioning their board of regents to move to a, a professional master's degree. I think SLU is, uh, doing the same thing. Louisiana college is out. McNeese is out. Nichols is out. So right now you got three, right? So half, half have gone away. Um, we'll see what ends up happening. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not in that setting you know i'm not in that fight over there um you know maybe the board of regents the the um, university of louisiana board of regents is going to make that decision maybe to keep both ull and southeastern maybe to keep one who knows uh lsu will probably do you know they're going to do just fine uh, i know their uh, program director out there um you know ray castle i i think he's a you know and and you got amanda benson they're both uh, leaders in in the athletic training world out there so that's that's just an example, right? So we don't really know where it's going to go. In Texas, there have been some programs that are, you know, have decided we can't compete in this new marketplace, so we're going to shut down. And then there's some other universities that, you know, came up, like Tarleton, said, I think we can compete. And they got up and running. Uh, it's Dr. Jennifer Lancaster out there. So she got, they, they, they proposed the program, she got it up and running. And got it accredited, and they're doing okay. And then uh, you got some other programs that uh, came up, and uh, like Sam Houston, they got accredited under the undergraduate model, and their transition their transition plan is to transition to a professional master's. Uh, also, for all of those listening, the business of what we do, if you want to be an athletic trainer, and that's the direction you want to go, there are a couple different ways that you can get there now. Right? One is. Um, let's talk about all the different athletic training models that are out there. You can go and you can uh, get a degree in exercise science and, um, you know, apply. It's a, it's what we call a direct entry. So it's a four plus two model. That's what we are at university of Houston. So you gotta get a four year degree. Um, you gotta meet all the prereqs and all the prereqs are going to be the same as prereqs that you'd go, that you'd um, take for, PA school, PT school, med school, right? It involves chemistry, physics, um, biology, all those other things. And let me also tell you, again, let's go back to understanding the business of what we do and why we do it. And then we're going to jump into building partnerships. Okay? So a lot of people say, you know, the only reason why we have all those prereqs is to weed people out. No, that's not the reason. Why do we have biology? Why do we have chemistry? Why do we have physics? Because they're all, they all represent science. And we are, as a profession, science and medicine. And so in that, we're trained to think a certain way. And that's what chemistry and physics are. They're science and medicine. So you go through that scientific process. That's the reason why it's there. So if you can think in that way, you'll do okay. And then you've got all the other degrees that, or all the other uh, classes that you're going to take in exercise science, biomechanics, anatomy, you know, all that other stuff. 
Uh, all right. So let's look at the labor outlook. Building partnerships. You want to go to building partnerships? Yeah. Has, let's uh, let's go that direction. Okay. All right. So uh, so let's look at the current employers right now. Okay. Current employers. Employers of ATs. And okay. Let's talk about how to build uh, partnerships. All right. Um, so well, let me let me go here real quick. All right. So just recently, I did a podcast with a local ER doctor, Dr. Gail Marjoram. Uh, she said she just normally goes by Dr. Gail. Um, and she is an emergency room doctor in yep. South Florida. Yep. And one of the things that she said was reach out. She's waiting for somebody, an athletic trainer to reach out. Yep. She doesn't know who the athletic trainers in the area are. And two, three years ago, I had Dr. Amy, my children's pediatrician on here. And she mm -hmm. said something similar is just create a little one page document, just set up a meeting you got it. Uh, and go from there. And so I admit that I have been lazy, I guess, in doing that. Um, or other things have gotten in the way, you know, I'm busy because it's not prioritized because there's nobody really pushing me to do that. Mm. Right. And so it's really just on me to create, to set that up, to do that, to explain to my admin why I'm doing it, why I'm going to be absent every Monday for, you know, four hours so I can go meet with, you know, these different doctors, that kind of thing, because I haven't done that. But through all these leadership podcasts, through all this other stuff that we've been doing, I'm really realizing, hey, this is about the patient because all those clinics that send a kid back for with a note for two weeks yep. out, no physical activity. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what we have to do. But if I go to them, say, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. How can we assist in returning the patient to a healthy participation? Then they're like, oh, well, let's see your athletic trainers. Or they'll yep. just say, okay, no, no fracture return per athletic trainer. Well, then now it opens up everything. They know who we are. Yep. I'm advocating for the profession, for me, for my students, for my program, for my school, or I can sit here. And so that conversation as part of the process of me going through all these other conversations, a meeting with you, and we're going to talk about all the partnerships that you've established and some of the criteria that you use to establish those in just a second. But those kind of things are, have been crucial in, in me being able to develop and understand that it's not about just taping ankles or setting up water, but it's really about the, the life of that individual athlete one at a time. You got it. So what you're talking about, Jeremy is uh, something that I call the village of medicine. That that's the, it. That's what it is. It's the village of medicine, right? So how do we go and create partnerships? One is we have to be able to talk, speak, behave, act medicine uh and you're right the physicians are just waiting um the athletic trainer in the mass casualty emergency medicine uh tactical medicine setting is exploding athletic trainers in every branch of the military the athletic trainer in um you know working with swat teams fire departments all those other being able to respond to those mass casualty incidents let's talk about you as an athletic trainer in today's time Okay, here you are, an athletic trainer. If something happens, you're primed to treat it, right? You've gone through the, um, uh, what, what training is that? You're going to do the stop the bleed, the yeah, ATKs. Yeah, stop the bleed, right, yeah. right. You, you did, right, you did stop the bleed. And stop the bleed is really, it came out of um, military medicine, combat medicine. Mm -hmm. It's about learning how to uh, treat shotgun blasts, it's learning, but, you know, how to treat uh, mass casualties. That's that's right within our wheelhouse. So that's the athletic training emergency, right? And so if all this goes down, God forbid, there's a mass casualty. That's it, right? And now you're court. Now you're working in emergency medicine center. So you already know how to do that. But the the issue is, is that when I see it, and it frustrates me, um, because as athletic trainers, and this is not this is not unique to our education and our profession. We don't have enough classes in business. We don't have enough classes in marketing. We don't have enough classes. And you know what? Nobody in medicine does. So real quick on that, I am actually in a group called Innovate AT. So I got Adam Larson and Scott Mullet. Both of those are in, in there. And it's about that. It's about athletic trainers creating business. So shout out to those guys in there and all the work that they're doing because I didn't go through the business classes, but I'm learning a lot through that group and through those guys who are creating their own business. Yep. Uh, Jared Parks as well, Adam Halpern doing a great job uh, there, Brandy Curry. But check that out if you are wanting to know more about business as an athletic trainer. I so these are, are. these are kind of 
a really good bridge for athletic trainers wanting to know more about business. So, it, I mean, that's what it's about. It's about a small business, about creating your brand. How do you, uh, let's say you're an athletic trainer in the secondary school setting. How do you justify your value to your administration? Right? Go and have a conversation. What are they really interested in? Metrics, outcomes, bottom line. Attendance. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. What What's your value? That's what you're trying to bring. And so when you're able to get into that village of medicine, now you start to be able, now you're, now you're starting to create the framework into something that we call interprofessional education, interprofessional dialogue. So one of the things that be, is becoming more and more prevalent in athletic training is if we're in a college with similar healthcare pro professionals, how do we get all our students together? So for instance, um, Texas Tech has an incredible model. Their director is Leslie Taylor. They're housed, they're housed in the uh, College of Health Sciences, right? The, the, the Health Sciences uh, College over at Texas Tech. I totally butchered the name of the college that they're in, but they're in with the medical school. And so when Texas Tech's kids go, you know, they start in the athletic training program, they are in the same cadaver dissection with PT, OT, PA. So from a very, what I like to call you're an embryo, right? In whatever direction you're going, you're mingling with people, right? You're, oh, I, I right? And, and you're, you're talking, building relationships. You're building relationships. You That's what it's about. And so you're growing up with one another. You know how to speak the same language. At University of Houston, we just started, we just approved, our Board of Regents approved the College of Medicine. One of the first things that we did as a program is we reached out to College of Medicine. We reached out to College of Pharmacy. We reached out to College of Nursing because we're all going to be housed now in this village of medicine. And what a great opportunity. Some of the conversations that we're having with the College of Medicine right now is that, uh, you know how many courses they have in, in musculoskeletal assessment? Not a whole lot. Same thing with nursing, not a whole lot. Same thing with pharmacy, not a whole lot. Guess where we're in? That's building partnerships. So all those students that are coming out of the College of Medicine, College of Pharmacy, College of Nursing, automatically know what athletic trainers are. So when the physician says, look, I totally get what an athletic trainer is. And now, boom, you got it. And it's about getting out there, get out of your own skin, go and learn about the business of athletic training, uh, go and promote your own brand. Some of the people that don't want to do it are the same people. I hear it all the time that are out there complaining about, you know, we're not getting the respect that athletic trainers deserve. Why? Yeah, it always comes back to what are you doing? Not yeah. what are we doing? What are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing? Right? How are you, how are you building your own brand? So um, I'm going to throw out another pet peeve, and I know this is going to upset a lot of people. It may even upset you. Why is athletic trainer? Why is athletic trainers? Why are we calling them coaches? We're not coaches. By the way, there is no degree for coaching, but there is a degree for athletic training. Right? We're not coach. Why do I call them coach? What What's the point of that? You're not a coach. You're you're a healthcare provider. You're an athletic trainer. Call you Mr. Jackson. Call you you know whatever it is. Here's another thing that may upset a lot of people. I won't call anybody that hasn't earned the title of doctor, doc. Just won't. That's not a, it's not an appropriate title, right? It gives a false impression of what we are and who we do. Uh, not who we do, what we are and what we do, right? So uh, that's all about building partnerships is understanding your own brand. Here's the other challenge I'm going to say. The definition of athletic training, it's public knowledge, bocatc.org. Go to my website, look it up. It's right there. Look at all the practice domains. Understand what our definition is. So when you get in the room talking with other healthcare providers, you understand your product. You understand what, as a professional, what we're all about. And once you're able to find that common ground, it's just simple sales. That's all this is, is go and find that common ground, go and develop those partnerships, right? So let's talk about real quick about all the uh, uh, about all the uh, professional settings. Uh, Scott Arsenault said, uh, "You're awesome. Always love listening to you. Scott. I love you too, big guy. Hope you're doing well." Uh, let's talk about all the current employers. 
professional collegiate sports, secondary and intermediate schools, sports medicine clinics, hospital ER and rehab clinics, occupational settings, military, government, law enforcement, physician offices, dance and fine arts. Uh, so you want to go to my website, www.hhp.uh.edu slash MAT. Go to the link that says documents. And under documents, I've got a recruiting packet for those that are interested in getting in the program. It's got a whole PDF. If you're listening, go and take it. If you're a practicing athletic trainer, you think it's going to help you, go and take it. Use it. Right? And this is another thing that I, I don't understand about our profession. I don't know how it is in other professions. I can only talk about us. Is that if one of us knows something, share it. Because if I know it and it's working for me and it could potentially help others, then share it, right? Grow it. The more people that know about that success, the more successful the profession's going to be. Don't, don't hold, you know, share it. That's how progress happens. That's how innovation happens. So, um, you know, whenever I tell people, when, you know, whenever I'm doing uh, recruiting for our students and stuff like that, whenever I share this with other healthcare providers, they're shocked. Athletic so, you, so your link, I just included it in the Facebook, the, awesome. li the live feed, and I'll drop it in the show notes too. Makes it a little easier. Again, this is sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash same team. So we're talking about building relationships, being on the same team. And so I kind of interrupted you there, but one of the cool things that you said is that you're bringing the nurses and the physical therapists and the, all the medical school students in there. And when I talked to Scott Saylor last year, that's one of the things he said he did. Yep. He brought those other professions into their classroom mm -hmm. to for their meetings or whatever it was yep and then they start exploring the room and see oh wait this is who they are this is what they do this boy this looks like a lot like medicine and so that's exactly one of the things that that we as athletic trainers can do especially in the secondary setting i've had chirotecture which is like a uh kind of like an arosti type thing um where it's a chiropractor but it does a lot of manual manipulations and stuff yep and then arosti i've had them come out i've had you know, physical therapists out here, whether it's on the podcast or whatever. I had uh, Dr. Gale. She yep. was in the ER. ER so now, now she um, knows what athletic trainer has a better idea because of me bringing her virtually into she, my... She's in South Florida? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if she's listening right now, a phenomenal athletic training program is University of South Florida. They are housed in the College of Medicine. They are... Um, th they lead the way. Um, but to, before... it's. Our, our job to reach out to her, not her job to reach out to well, us. I just, what I wanted to do was just tell her that, you know, if anybody out there in South Florida is listening, it's a phenomenal program. I mean, it, it really set, it really set the way for a lot of people to follow. And, uh, back in the day when Mickey Cuppet was running that program, she was uh, partners with Jeff Conan. Both of them will be on the podcast in March. Yep. And, um, you know, they were just killing it. They were just. They were, they were trailblazers and, and it's hard sometimes to be that trailblazer because you're so out in front, uh, you, you, you look crazy, right? I mean, you're so out, like, could you imagine, uh, part of my job at the university of Houston is I work with the, uh, astronaut strength conditioning and rehabilitation program at NASA. And there are, by the way, for those that are listening, there are two certified athletic trainers, Bruce Nieschwitz and Stacy Latham that are at NASA. Um, a lot of people don't know that. So, you know, think about what they do. Think about all the international populations and all the international relations that they have. And they have to, they have to justify their existence, not only the U S government, but they got to justify their existence to the Japanese space agency, the European space agency, the Canadian space agency, the Russian space agency, all it's international all the other agencies that participate in this. And by the way, athletic training as we know it only exists in the United States and Canada. That's it. Everywhere else, you know, it's called physio or sports science or however you want to describe it. So we're, we're a very unique, um, we're very unique. And uh, so we have to be able to get outside of our original roots and go out there and promote and build. Okay. So on that building relationships, we've talked about how you've done that at, with your program there about incorporating other, um, 
medical professions into yep. the education part process. Um, but when you got here to Houston, you had meetings all the time and you talked about how um, you had a meeting or you try to get a meeting with Dr. Lowe, but you couldn't and then something like that. And so, yeah. you, so start, you start leveraging, right? If I can't get to you, I probably know somebody that can. So it's about creating those relationships. Uh, remember in athletic training, the sports medicine, first of all, the sports medicine world is really not that big. All right. As compared to all the other worlds they have out there. Uh, and especially if you're in uh, a, a specific setting. So I want to get a meeting with Dr. Lowe. Super busy guy. Amazing physician. Team physician for the Texans, the Rockets. U of H. Right, U of H. I mean, uh, every, every person in the world knows about Dr. Lowe. They want to come see him. Uh, you know, hard to get a meeting. Hard to, hard to figure that out. But who else do I know? I know Bob Marley, athletic trainer. Bob Marley, you know, can get the low in, you know, a phone call. And low puts a lot of value in Bob. Lots. They've been together for decades. So I couldn't get I couldn't get directly low. What I could do is get to get to Marley and say, hey, Bob, I need a favor. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. And now I'm trying to accomplish something similar. Still trying to get a meeting with Dr. Lowe because uh, we want to create uh, some endowed scholarships to give money to our our incoming our current and incoming students. But in order for me to do that, Dr. Lowe is so powerful that you know, with one one phone call. Think about everything he's got influence over. One phone call, I can get eighty percent of what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get. So that's the other thing too: is promote your value and um, understand who you are, understand what you are, understand your personality. And if you are by nature an introvert, which a lot of uh, healthcare providers are, uh, it you're going to have to get outside your own comfort zone. You're going to have to get out there and start shaking hands. And, you know, my thing is uh, I get really frustrated by people that don't care around their business cards. If you've ever seen the movie, Glenn, Gary, Glenn Ross, it's with Alec Baldwin. Okay. And I'll, I'll send, I'll, I'll show you the clip privately um, because it's not appropriate for the podcast. So, there's a there's something that he always says ABCs right always be closing always be closing SNL did a skit on it he was like Santa's you know head elf and he did a little shtick on it but yeah always be closing you're always out there think about think about who your most valuable assets are here who your most valuable assets it's your it's your student athletes right your patients who's the second most valuable asset I don't know what you're going to say, me or no, their the parents. principal? The parents, okay. Right? If you want to leverage anything, imagine. And so let's go back to, I don't have enough supplies. My my uh, administration won't support. They don't really understand what I do. Well, that's on you, Chief. Okay? And get out there and tell them, this is what you do. This is the value. Oh, and by the way, when you go to the parents and you say, I don't have the resources to provide the appropriate health care. Those are major words, right? You want to see people get up in arms and, and get in the principal's face and get in the superintendent's face and all those other things. What do you mean you can't provide appropriate health care for my, my child? This is the most important thing. That's the most important thing to them. The resources that I have, and I've seen that tactic used, especially in Louisiana. And you know who's brilliant at it? Scott Arsenault. Ronnie Harper. I mean, they, in my opinion, um, they set the tone for all the progress that happened in Louisiana. And they were out in front and they, they understood the business and, you know, they got into it and they started making change. All right. So we've talked about, you know, like I want to set up meetings with doctors, but you're kind of, kind of flipping that around on me saying that I need to be more intentional about building the relationships with the parents. Because I do, I think I do a pretty good job of building the students. They know me, they come to me, they talk to me, that kind of thing. But as far as the parents, at here at my school, we have very little parent involvement. Okay. I mean, I can call a kid's parents, the whatever three phone numbers they have on the rank one, and none of them have, none of them work, right? Or their address is wrong, or the parents don't speak English, or 
the parents are like, well, I can't come and get them until six. Especially with the same thing in Los Angeles. Right. So how, talk to me how I'm going to build those relationships to build up my program. Those relationships with the parents that want to be uninvolved? Yeah, more or less. So, I, you know, there's only so much that you can do, right? Mm -hmm. you, you try to provide as much as you possibly can. When I was doing outreach in Los Angeles, um, we did as much as we possibly could. We tried to, you know, we, we'd have uh, meetings. We'd have, um, you know, if, if you spoke Spanish, we had somebody that can translate in Spanish. We, we tried to find people that spoke languages that the parents could understand. Because, you know, in the middle of L.A., a lot like Houston, very, very diverse. Mm -hmm. And what you have to understand is that even before you get to relationships with the physicians, right, you got to get parent buy-in. And let's say that they don't speak any, you know, let's say don't, English is the second language for them, broken English. Find the language that they do speak. See if you can find somebody that can interpret it for them. Because ultimately, those parents are still responsible for those, for those children. That's what it is at the intermediate and secondary school center, right? You always need parental consent. And then so... You have to do a few things simultaneously. One is that. The other one is being able to speak the language of medicine so you can go and talk about how do I build your network of referrals? How, you know, take your team physician and, you know, how does that team physician gain confidence in what you're doing? Because, you know, geez, every time I send somebody to Jeremy, he nails the diagnosis. He treats them, and when he when you know you got to remember, ultimately the physician's in charge. So every time that that student athlete comes back to me from Jeremy, they are they're functioning. Uh, they got their range of motion back. They feel good. They they speak all those other things. When I was when I was in graduate school, I learned a lot about it, right? Especially developing. Um, developing those uh, business relationships. And the reason why was because of our head athletic trainer, Dan Bailey, who ran the athletic training uh, room, right? This, the Long Beach State Sports Medicine. He ran it like a business. The reason why I ran it like a business is because he was in business. He made millions. And we were billing for services in California at Long Beach State before anybody had ever heard about it. And so we had all those relationships develop. We had all those relationships and I, and I saw it in action. It was awesome. And one of the people that I ended up treating at Long Beach State was the president of the university. And so, you know, for me, I learned how to, um, so Dr. Maxson, he was the president of Long Beach State. He grew the university from 15,000 to 40,000 and he did it in a few years. And uh, I, I treated him for tennis elbow because he shook so many hands, right? So there I was, and I learned every time I met with him, this is what year one looked like. This is what – and so you start to learn how to do it. You start to learn how to go and have conversations with physicians, with school – you know, go and have a conversation with the school nurse. Get the school nurse involved. A lot of times there's conflict, especially in the secondary school setting. Who, you know, who do we go to? What, what's the, what's the, you know, who does what? No, no, go and have a conversation. Break some walls down. Go. One of the things that Bubba said that he always did was go up front and have coffee with the principal during, yeah. during the like morning when kids are walking in. So same deal. You go up and go and have know, a conversation. That school nurse went through some education. Yeah. Have some pecans in their office or whatever it is, yeah. you know, just go chill in there for a few minutes. Say, hey, what, you know, is there something you need help with or that kind of thing? Uh, just there, being willing to step out New and have those conversations. Yeah. There's a high school in New Orleans. Um, I forget what it is. It's a private high school. Um, the athletic trainer is, um, oh, it's Newman high school. It's Newman, uh, private school in New Orleans. The athletic trainer, um, is housed in the same facility as the school nurse. The athletic trainer oversees all um, all medical operations for the school. All right? Not the school nurse. It's the athletic trainer. They're all housed in the same. They're all housed in the same place. Um, and the reason why is, I mean, think about what ends up happening, right? If there's an orthopedic issue, where are they going to go to? Athletic trainer. If there's a gen med issue. By the way, that's part of our curriculum. It's getting a bigger, bigger part. Where are they going to go? More likely, athletic trainer. Right, so all these things are are involved, right? And and think about what we do. And so it's about having those conversations, 
and finding the common ground. And understand, in order to do that, you have to understand who we are and what we do as a profession. The athletic trainers that um, you know still believe that, oh, geez, you know, I can, you know, if I'm working for a PT clinic, then that PT is in charge. No. That's against state law. It's the physician that oversees the athletic trainer. Now, under state law, if a PT has got a, a DPT, then they're able to practice on their own. All right, they can practice independent. They don't really, really need a whole lot of referrals. But no, the athletic trainer, according to the definition, works under the direction or in collaboration with physician. physician. Doctor of physical therapist is not a physician. Neither is a chiropractor, neither is a dentist. It's, it's a physician. And the other thing I would say, too, is that find the physician that understands what it is that you're trying to accomplish. In today's model, um, I think that the appropriate team physician in the secondary school setting, you want to go out and you want to look for a pediatrician with a sports medicine fellowship trained background, right? Because these are all pediatrics, right? In your setting, you're looking at kids anywhere between 14 and 18. 18, you know, you're just crossing over as an adult, but you're still growing. This is still pediatrics. What about the athletic trainer in the intermediate setting? Those are pediatrics. What about the athletic trainer now in all the youth settings? Those are all pediatrics. They come with their own uh, unique healthcare issues. So you have to learn how to understand and talk that language. If I'm an athlete, if I'm the athletic trainer in a collegiate setting, team physician, primary care doc, Sports medicine fellowship trained. You have to understand sports medicine is a specialty just like any other specialty out there. It's not just anybody can do it. It's a sports medicine is a specialty very similar to uh, if I were to make the analogy in military. Okay. Like special ops. That's what sports medicine is. It, it looks a lot like a mash unit. And the only reason why I say it is that I've, I've been involved with military and some other spec ops stuff. So I've seen it. We work very similarly. How about the athletic trainer, you know, in uh, how about the athletic trainer in the physician setting? Now, by definition, that's a very easy transition for athletic trainers to go into. Why? This is what we do every day, all day. Every day, all day, we are working in collaboration with that physician. So the athletic trainer that is in the physician setting, like Max Mahaffey with Dr. Bajani, yeah, we just saw him yesterday. My my son uh, fractured his fifth metacarpal, and so um, Max Mahaffey is in, is in a physician. That's that's every day, all day. The athletic trainer in the physician setting, whether it's primary care or orthopedics, Forrest Pekka has got some great literature out there that says, for every dollar invested in the athletic trainer in that setting, three to seven dollar return on investment. So let's just say, for all the naysayers out there that still think the world is flat. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to call out any names. You know who I am. You know who I'm talking about. All the athletic trainers are out there that still think the world is flat. What about the, you know, why are we moving to this degree? Why? Uh, all right. Well, the athletic trainer is never going to make more money. All right. Now let's think about it. Let's just say the athletic trainer in that setting is making $100,000. Possible. Right. And do the math. That's three hundred thousand dollars saving. That's a three hundred dollar return on investment. It's different than savings. Okay. okay. All right. So if I look at P and L, profit and loss. Okay. Uh, if I look at my P and L statement, and I'm talking about the athletic trainer in the physician setting, my return on investment as a physician is a three to seven dollar return on investment, meaning that if I pay that athletic trainer a hundred k. Just on that one athletic trainer, I can go hire three other athletic trainers and pay them each $100,000. And each of them now will have a 3 to $7 return on investment. It's because of the productivity, right? Athletic trainers by nature know how to do this. And I would go out and I'd say better than any other profession. That's the business. That's the partnership. That's where we need to be. And whenever people are saying, and this is the other thing I can't stand to, whenever I hear 
somebody saying, um, boy, athletic trainers, you know, and, and they're talking to the general public. Uh, what do you do? I'm an athletic trainer. Oh, that's cool. And I'll ask, do you know what that is? Nope. You know what I, you know what I don't do? I don't say, well, have you ever watched a football game? Because that's not an appropriate analogy anymore. Now, it's something that everybody can identify with. So I understand why they're doing it. But what I do is that I, I actually, I've memorized the, the definition. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know that athletic trainers could do all that. Uh-huh. We're not just in sports settings. We're in military. We're in occupational. We're in, you know, we're at Disney. And the laugh that I was, yeah. yeah, we're at NASA. We're at uh, NASCAR. We're at X Games. We're at motocross. We're at rodeo. We're everywhere. We're in occupational settings. We're, we're, we are everywhere. We're at, uh, how about Webb Miranda here in Houston, United Airlines? Right? So what athletic trainers have to do is there are a lot of still the old guard that can't figure out like the athletic trainers at NASA. There, there are literally some athletic trainers that have come up to me and said, I don't understand how you tape an ankle in space. Okay. And uh, part of me is like, are you serious? Like, are we really having this conversation right now? Mm -hmm. Think about everything that we do and everything we know about in athletic training. And so what's going to end up happening is that you're going to start to see specialties just like medicine. Do you know that, you know, if you're going to be a Walter Lowe, an orthopedic surgeon, if you're going to be an Andrew Lee, primary care, if you're going to be a uh, David Crumby, orthopedic surgeon, if you're going to be an ER doc, if you're going to be a gynecologist, dermatologist, it doesn't matter. Neurology, it doesn't matter. How about uh, Matt Kepling, Keplinger, hand uh, surgeon, Memorial Herman, part of UT Physicians. He was an athletic trainer first, went back and uh, went through osteopathic medicine. So... Um, they all go through the same education. They all have to take the same classes. All right. So, um, Brendan, uh, Moriarty said, Hey, thanks for the great info. He's going to have to catch the rest of it later, but thanks for jumping in there. Perry also watching live and then John Hill. Um, so looking at me, athletic trainer, secondary school. Yep. Uh, one of the things that I'm kind of getting from you here is if I'm going to go set up a meeting with the local doctors around here, I just, Go and each and every single doctor, I say, okay, I'm going to, can I meet with you on a Monday, January 1st uh, at 8 a.m. and then the next one at 12 and then the next one at 2 or something like that. Um, then what I need to know is I need to know the definition of an athletic trainer yep. so that I can clearly communicate who we are and what we do and how we can work together. And then I've created a, like a little one page document. I posted it here in the Facebook. It's also on the show notes or it's, uh, Facebook, let me see real quick. I think it's Facebook or sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash local medical provider letter. Okay. Um, so that is um, so, so I've created that so that I can take that, hand that out and give it out. Um, but what else do I need to do to get started or to make those meetings efficient, All right? Because we've already talked about how we're lacking in athletic training and some of the things that you can do is invite them in. But I'm going to go in into their place, yep. meet them, and tell them who we are and how we can work together. What are some of the other things that you feel like I need to do to prepare? How can you be of value to their practice? So yeah, we can have a meeting, but I don't understand how you can help me. Answer the question. I mean, you don't have to answer it now, but that's something to think about. Okay, so here's a great answer. Uh, here's how I can help you. You know, we always have injuries. We always have, you know, people that need to be seen. And what I can do is that uh, when you're, you know, when, when this student athlete has a particular need, I understand that, you know, um, I don't know who, who, who is Pasadena's official medical provider. Uh, used to Methodist. Okay. So you may have already an existing agreement that says if anything happens, they have to go to Methodist. Okay. And I'm assuming that Methodist, um, I, I don't know if there's a already an agreement in place where Methodist is, is getting some sort of uh, revenue, but you know what? It's from a hospital setting. This is great marketing because at all your football games, guess what banners up there? Used to Methodist. Yeah. How are they making, how are they making their money back? Anything that happens automatically gets referred to. Used to Methodist. 
and they're going to bill insurance. That's that's the reason why. So in every business like this, they have to have some sort of, you look at profit and loss, mm -hmm. right? And from tax purposes, they, sports medicine is a great way to give back to the community. And you're going to make money indirectly by you know all the referrals that you're going to get back. So that's another thing, right? You go out and you start having a conversation. This is how I can help you. Anytime that we have an issue in this, I'm going to refer it back to you. That increases their that increases their value. Already, that's a yes, right? So here's here's everything that you're able to to provide for them. That's your that's your answer, and you gotta you're gonna have to be creative. All right, so set up the meeting. Yep. Know who we are as athletic trainers and what we do, and know how you can work together with the doctor and and ultimately how it's you're going to benefit doctor, it's anybody. Right? How do you work together with the physician? How do you work together with the dentist? How do you work together with the physical therapist, the chiropractor? Okay. So what I meant is the local medical provider okay. rather than the doctor. So how you can work together and how you can benefit them. And so one of the things that I actually did is ABC Dental is here, right in Pasadena. Yep. Um, Great place. Yeah. It's right down the, right down the road. So yep. it's probably the closest dental office. And so I kind of did this before really knowing what to do. And mine was more of a like, a partnership kind of like Memorial Hermann's got this banner here or used yep. a Methodist has the banner there. I was thinking more like what I actually did was, Hey, I want a new Frio unit. Why don't we put ABC dental on that Frio unit? Awesome. And then it refers to kids there. But I didn't really have a clear plan of who I was, how I was going to benefit, what we were going to do. And also I was, I think I was looking for too much at one time because I wanted, I wanted to ba basically establish that relationship and say, hey, we need somebody that is kind of on call or somebody that we had a basketball game, yep. seven o'clock at night, a kid gets a tooth knocked out. Yep. I want to be able to send them to you rather than send them to the ER. Uh, and then also here's this thing about Frio and sponsoring. So a little bit about that situation. Do you do that just like a, hey, here I am and then come back, hey, let's meet next month or hey, let's meet you know six months from now? Um, so who are your... The question I would ask for you now is that um, who in that circle, right? Uh, who in that circle do you need to be constantly in partnerships with? In that circle with the dentist so, or are you talking no, no, about the local so, medical yeah, providers? So local medical provider. Who, like who do you want immediately in that circle? Honestly, I, I feel like I want to meet with any of the any of the clinics that see my students. So kind of like going through doctor's notes or physicals and saying, okay, here, who's this, is who we are, this is what we do, because those are the ones that the kids are going to. Yep. So there's one that's literally like 500 feet from us, okay. one that's across the street from us. And so I need to go over there and say, this is who we are, this is what we do. And I, and you know, I and got what's that. The, so the question now is, I would ask, what's the value of them being partners with you? And if you look at our website, um, I clearly have said that these are partnerships and they are, they're true partnerships. Some other programs we use, these are clinical affiliated sites and stuff like that. No, they're partnerships because there are a lot of things that I'm going to ask of them that are go ab above and beyond what is pen and paper for our affiliation agreements. All right. So what I, again, this is, this is why we're working through this. What I'm thinking is what I really want them to be able to do is to say, to, to say, uh, no fracture, cleared to per athletic trainer, uh -huh. right? Rather than just out two weeks. Uh -huh. And in improving the outcome of the patient is is mostly my, I guess my focus, my drive, uh -huh. but then there obviously, obviously there needs to be other, lots of other. So, right. So I understand where you're going from and what you, it's all about conversations, right? The other thing that you have to understand too is that in medicine, we're too siloed. And what that means is that um, there's still some turf battles going on. And that's not really what produces good patient outcomes, right? Good patient outcomes is, 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 is a continuum and the patient's in the center. And how does that continuum outside of that work? The continuum outside of that works by having conversations, by speaking with the healthcare providers and saying, look, this is, this is what we do. This is how we do it. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll keep you informed, everything that's going on. But this would be no different than a physician writing a script back to a licensed professional counselor, back to a physical therapist, back to an occupational therapist. 
back to a chiropractor, back to a dentist, whatever it is. Eval and treat. Eval and treat. Keep them updated. Speak their language. That's how you're going to gain trust. That's how they're going to say Jeremy Jackson is a valuable component to our medical to our medical model. Jeremy Jackson produces good patient outcomes. That's what it comes down to. And the only way that you can get to it is by understanding your business. And we are the business of medicine. And we are athletic training. We're, we, we represent a part of the medical model. And that's one of the reasons why I am a believer in, um, I think, athletic training needs to move out of athletics. A lot of people, oh, you're, you know, you're turning your back on our roots. Uh-huh. I don't think I am. I think I'm looking forward to the future. Think about um, where your original degrees came from. Some of the degrees that, you know, we're getting kinesiology. You know what kinesiology was before? Physical education. Is that a, still an appropriate description of what we do? No. So is athletic training still in the athletics model? An appropriate description of what we do as a profession holistically? No. It may be appropriate for the athletic trainer in uh, intermediate, secondary school setting, a collegiate setting, a pro setting. Fine. But now what you're seeing is that, especially in the collegiate settings, you're seeing some, not all, but some uh, sports medicine programs, you know, the athletic trainers, moving into the student health centers because the, the value that the athletic trainers now have to the overall production of the university is huge because university is not just about sports teams, right? Think about it. They got intramurals. They have general population. They have all these other things. So if I have a kid, if I have a college kid that's walking across campus and trips and falls down the stairs – and goes to the student health center. How many of those? How many of those uh, primary care physicians do you think know about orthopedics? How many of them can do an orthopedic evaluation, a musculoskeletal evaluation, the way that an athletic trainer can? Not a whole lot, unless they've gone through a sports medicine fellowship. Bingo! There's the value of the athletic trainer. In comes athletic trainer, does the evaluation, right? Order the films, read the films, right? So it's it's about going out and understanding, spending time. So that those people around you understand what athletic trainers do. And here's where, as a profession, we have trouble. Out of all the other medical professions, you know who is not part of that village of medicine right now as a, as a, as a whole? Athletic trainers. At, uh, out of all the other like professions. So let's define what like professions are. Chiropractors. Physical therapists, occupational therapists, PAs. We cover all that. I would, I would even include nurse practitioners. So these are all like professions. You know who's not holistically at the professional master's degree level yet? Athletic trainers. It'll happen in 2022. So if we want to be in that village of medicine, we got to act, behave, and, and speak like medicine. That's how you gain the partnerships. That's the secret. That's understanding the business of what we do. And it's exciting, man. Right? Personally, the reason why I went to go get my doctorate in education, so I got my EDD in educational leadership, and I have a subspecialty in educational law, was because um, I went back and I looked at all the people that mentored me. You know what they had their doctorates in? Educational leadership, administration, curriculum instruction, higher, educa you know, higher education and curriculum organizational leadership. So I was like, why reinvent the wheel? This is the direction I want to go. So that's what you're going to have to figure it out. Now, here's the other thing about building those partnerships. Athletic training is moving to the medical model, the residency model. There are a lot of residencies that are popping up. Try to figure out, have some vision for those that are coming out, have some vision about where you want to go. Go and do that residency, just like medicine. So look at all the physicians that are around you right now. Your primary care doc went through medical school, four years of med school, did a three-year uh, residency in uh, primary care, and maybe did a one-year fellowship in sports medicine, right? Everybody now is going to be fellowship trained, everybody. So let's say orthopedic surgery. A lot of people, the misconception about orthopedic surgery is like, if you're an orthopedist, you should understand sports medicine. No, you can be orthopedic, you can be general orthopedics. You could be just trauma. You could be oncology. You could be just joint replacement, 
right? You could be all those other things. So sports medicine is a is a specialty within that specialty. Same thing with athletic training. So you want to be, uh, here's where I think the profession is going to go. You want to be an athletic trainer in a secondary school setting? You're going to go and you're going to go uh, and get a, uh, a master's degree or a fellowship in, uh, or a residency rather in pediatrics. That makes total sense. What about the DAT? Right? That's how you're going to get that post-professional advanced practice education. That's all about the partner. So understanding what we do, understanding who we are. Go back and just understand the AT Strategic Alliance. Just start there. I've asked a lot of athletic trainers. You know what the AT Strategic Alliance is? No. I'd actually never heard about it before. But March 1st is our planned discussion with AT Strategic Alliance here on the podcast. So, Great. So Josh will be leading that, hopefully. But, all right. It. So I'm going to kind of kind of close it out, sum it yeah. up here. here we One, go. we need to know who we are. We need to memorize or or know the definition of athletic trainer. Yeah. We need to spend the time. And again, that goes back to like the leadership podcast where if it's getting up early to get work done or whatever it is, you're focusing, you're intentional with your time. We need to create something to give them and leave them. You need to schedule the meetings. You need to know the benefit to you and to them and then be able to clearly define how that's going to benefit and again, focusing on the patient. Is uh, that that pretty much cover? Yeah, I want to. I want to address time real quick. Okay. Okay. Um, Forty hours a week doesn't exist anymore. I don't care if you're a teacher. I don't care if you work for the postal service. Forty hours a week may may still exist at McDonald's. Still may exist at some things where you're going to punch a clock. But the majority of the time, forty hours a week doesn't work, especially if you're salary. So. For the athletic trainers are out there, 40 hours a week doesn't work. You know what the magic number in medicine is when they're going through education? 70. 80. That's the magic number, 80. So if you're going to be in medicine, by definition, medicine is a service industry. You're just going to be on, dude. Sorry. You're going to be taking calls. Now, does that mean that you should be here at 5 o'clock in the morning and leave at 10 o'clock at night? No. No. Dictate your value. Dictate your schedule. You deserve a lunch. Everybody else is taking a lunch. You deserve a lunch. The athletic training will be open from this time to this time. We'll be closed for lunch. And then we'll be open from this time to this time. Just like any other medical provider. Right? Uh, you have uh, another athletic trainer working with you. Come up with a system where you guys are on call. Uh, the folks over at Dawson have done it. Paraland's done it. I did it when I was in graduate school. There were six of us, six GAs that were on. One of us took call uh, every weekend, right? So every every six weeks, I was I took call. It didn't matter what was going on, right? So obviously, your off-season. didn't matter what off-season athlete it was. I took call. And the expectation was that I'll meet you in the athletic trainer. Uh, the other thing, too, is you document. Document, 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 document. And when you're done documenting, document some more. Document your documentation because the athletic trainer that doesn't think that they're going to not going to get named in a lawsuit is stupid, right? Is, is ignorant and naive. And now that's dangerous. Look at the athletic, the, the legal digest and athletic training. It's written by uh, um, a couple people that are big in, in the legal side. And uh, the other thing I would tell athletic trainers too is go and get your own liability insurance. Because if you think the school is going to cover it or not, make sure you have your own life. It's going to cost you a couple hundred bucks. Go and do it. So guard your time. Your time is valuable. Um, your, your product is you. That's your product. Guard it. Protect it. Build it. What's going to make the difference between a good athletic trainer or a great athletic trainer? It's your ability to solve problems. That's what it's about. That's what the education is all about. I think that's what it comes down to. And that's how, you, that's how you're going to build the relationships. That they're going to find value in what you do. They're going to trust that 
you know what? Every time I send something to Jeremy Jackson, I don't know how he does it, but he always figures it out. And now you build this reputation. You you want to go and figure out the problems? Nobody else can figure out this problem. Who are you going to go to? Jeremy Jackson. Because that's the reputation you built. That's what it all comes down to. And it all comes down to business. In order to do it, you have to understand how business works. Spend some time on CNBC. Watch the Shark Tank. Listen to how they speak. That's how the rest of the world talks. Valuations. You know, and listen to how the people pitching their product. That's called an elevator speech. That's what you're doing. It's an elevator. Why do they call it? You know why they call it an elevator speech? Because there's about 20 seconds. That's how you yeah. Got. If, if you got into the elevator with the CEO of the company, they're going to the top floor. You got about 30 seconds to a minute. That's it. Pitch it. Practice it. You got business cards? Keep them. Hand them out. Be approachable. Talk with them. Right. The other thing too is that don't, don't, uh, don't give yourself too. Uh, you, you still need some time for you, just like anybody else. Uh, when's the last time you saw? Your, hey, let me. And this is the thing that I have a conversation with collegiate athletic trainers. When's the last time that you had a runny nose and you called your primary care doc at two o'clock in the morning to say that you had a runny nose? Never. So in medicine, why do we do that for athletic trainers? Now, a lot of people say because we have different relationships. Yeah, I get that. And that's what makes us very unique. But guard your time. You're a family man. You're married. You got kids. Protect it. Don't give it all away. Just like the rest of medicine does. Simple. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Anything else? Got any other questions? Uh, no, there, yep. Scott Arsenal said, be the solution. Again, Scott Muller joined. I think I mentioned everybody else that I saw on the live Facebook. Uh, again, that's facebook.com slash sports medicine broadcast. This episode is sports medicine broadcast.com slash same team, where I'll have a link to the show notes, the, the Josh's website, the resource that I created that I'm going to plan to take out and give to doctors. Um, Justin Strife had also mentioned that having like a one page concussion, like current concussion laws, uh, to hand out as well. And then that way doctors are, you're kind of on the same page saying, Hey, this is what we follow. This is the current state stuff. Um, those tips might be useful as well, but again, start with, with who you are and how it's going to benefit. And then also, like Josh said, guard your time. So it may be that I need to meet my principal. Hey, Every Monday I'm going to schedule or every first and third Monday I'm going to schedule appointments. I'm going to be absent, but I'm going to be meeting with local medical providers to improve the care and improve the outcomes for our students because mm -hmm. it is his students as well. Our students, mm -hmm. our patients uh, improve their you know, behavior in the classroom because now they're feeling good. They're feeling healthy. They're in class and those kind of things like that. So like Josh said, know, know who you're talking to, speak their language. So it may be going to sit in the board meeting, go sit in the principal's office, have that conversation with them, go to the nurse's office, talk, have those conversations, be available, guard your time. There's kind of a lot there, but if you go back and listen to this a couple of times, you may be able to catch it all. All right. So Josh, I'm sure you wouldn't want to end this without giving the plug website. in the program. Time to plug the University of Houston Master of Athletic Training Program. Uh, you want to know more about us and everything that we have to offer? Please go to www dot hhp dot uh dot edu slash mat if you're a facebooker follow us on uh, university of houston master of athletic training program like our page follow us we're always putting stuff up there um i think we're leading the way in a lot of different areas uh if you're a twitter i'm i'm not a tweeter twitter i'm not on the twitter sphere uh but dr knobloch is it's at uhmat so there you go. All right, okay. so you want to check out U of H M A T, and again, they're doing a lot of cool things, and I I'm excited to to be hanging out with Josh, and I get to catch some of the cool things that they're doing, meeting some of the students, and as I'll be looking for a replacement because Bill's retirement this year, that's probably one of the first places I'm going to go is maybe go spend some time at U of H and kind of recruit the kids or or just see who they are and see what Josh yeah. thinks, um, and so again, just building that relationship. So again produces a better outcome. I got to have somebody I can work with and more importantly, somebody that can work with me. 
uh, put up with me all that time. About, it's never about your qualifications. It's always about how well can you play in the sandbox with others. Exactly. That's what it comes down to. Before we go, I'm going to call out everybody else too. Okay, here we go. I'm not calling out by names. I'm just going to say, whenever we're at a professional conference, unless the culture of that conference is totally laid back, like down in South Padre, Okay. When I see people at the sports medicine update, when I see people at G hats and they're in jeans, they're in, uh, you know, sweats, they're in shorts. Don't, don't do that, please. Cause I'm going to call you out. I'm going to say something about it. All you're doing is diminishing your own value and you're bringing down the entire profession. Go to another medical conference. Show me how many people are showing up in that type of attire. Show up in professional attire. Have some pride in what you're doing. You're wearing facial hair, keep it clean. Right? You, uh, I don't care what you do. Just go and take a look. There are all sorts of styles out there now. And that fits in perfectly actually with this conversation because I wouldn't want to go with a scraggly, unshaved beard wearing gym shorts to meet a doctor. I've made that mistake before. I had Dr. Summerat here. I was wearing gym shorts, Crocs, t-shirt uh, on the podcast, but I've learned, right? So right now I'm sitting here. I got a polo. I got some khaki pants. Well, they're black khaki pants and Sorry. shoes on, right? And so I've, I've learned that it's important. Uh, the question I always ask is that let's say that you had to go and you had to go yourself or your wife, or your kids had to go see a medical provider and they walked in wearing some of the stuff that I see our athletic trainers wearing. How would you feel? Not very confident. Let's say you were going to go buy a house and the real estate agent showed up in a pair of gym shorts, Crocs, you know, scraggly, doesn't keep themselves, you know, every, everybody's built a different way, but doesn't have any pride in how they look. Does that make you any more confident in buying their buying a house? You're about to invest a lot of money. It's not about the house. It's about your um, your belief in them. Nope. Out. Same. It's business. That's what it's about. Understand the business. Understand how to shake a hand. Understand the value of a business card. Understand that after you meet with somebody, send an email. It's really nice to meet you. Right? I really appreciate your time. That's what it's about. All right. And with I mean, that, yeah, I, I can go and, on this. For and with days, that, but sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash same team. So for Josh, Jeremy here on the Sports Medicine Broadcast, that is a wrap. I'm going bald, man. Look at this. You see that? Are we still on? Yeah. <laughs>